Hello, we have with us Falguni Nair, founder and CEO of Nika. Many thanks for speaking to PTI, ma'am. Pleasure is mine. I'm honored to be here. Let's start off uh, with startup uh, Mahakumb. This brings together thousands of startups and thousands of budding entrepreneurs for a three-day event, like a mega event uh, of sorts. What is this event or what can events like these do for the startup ecosystem, innovation and entrepreneurship in India? Uh, I think this is an amazing showcase that uh, uh, tells the young uh, generation what kind of innovation is already going on throughout the country. And I think uh, we, you know, the organizers have been able to bring together all of the, you know, so many industries and uh, young innovation companies from those industries are all here today. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's going to be a delight for those visiting to be able to see the kind of uh, innovation that's sweeping all across India. Indeed, ma'am. The three-day event provides a platform for India's startup ecosystem to showcase, uh, you know, the interest that its interest extend beyond just the valuations. And it is indeed becoming a powerful force for good and change. How can startup Mahakum play a role in shaping new India? I think, you know, uh, the startup ecosystem has always focused on the consumer. And what is that consumer need that they want to st or solve through innovation? And that's how they went beyond the existing industries and brought solutions that allowed new industries to flourish. And today what we are seeing is their size and scale is immense. Uh, most of the startup companies have like millions of customers. Like if you look at Nike, we have more than 25 million customers. The size and scale of the customer and the ease with which we serve them, it's all possible for two reasons. Firstly, the solution is right and the consumers are embracing it. And all through length and breadth of the country, it is working out. And on top of that, you know, we, it's all technology enabled. And hence, being able to do complex things at scale is possible. And in today's social media centric world, uh, again, that becomes another platform to assess and reach those customers, access and reach those customers. So I think it's, a, it's coming together of a lot of industries to facilitate a solution that is very unique. You have many firsts to your credit. Uh, how has been the journey for you as an entrepreneur or may I say woman entrepreneur? Uh, tell us about the challenges you faced and what would be your advice to other entrepreneurs today? I think I have, you know, I was a late entrepreneur. I started uh, as I was uh, uh, nearing year, age 50. I think this is known to everyone. Uh, I think uh, to me, entrepreneurship has stirred an emotion uh, is just amazing. I think entrepreneurial journeys are amazing. They give you huge amount of, uh, um, you know, positive energy. They give you, uh, you wake up every morning to want to solve at scale the consumer problems. You also get a lot of satisfaction trying to, uh, to do um, a lot of obviously solution for your consumers. But beyond that, like you said earlier, that many of these are becoming uh, instruments for public good because you are able to do uh, solutions at a scale that you are able to use them for public good. So I think entrepreneurship is also about risk taking. It's also being able to go through ups and downs of the journey. So it's a mix, uh, it's a mixed emotion. I mean, I wouldn't say it's a, emotion is positive, but the journey is mixed and you have to be able to go through ups and downs of the journey and have that energy every day to move forward and reach your destination. What would be your advice to other entrepreneurs today? You know, those who are aspiring or new entrepreneurs of today. I've always said to entrepreneurs that love what you do because it'll take a long time. The journeys have to be long. I always said more than 10 year plus to be able to reach your destination and create a value that is sustainable because you don't want to, it's not about a short term value gain. You sell something to someone and move on. You want to build a company and an, like Nika is trying to build a company and an enterprise that will have a long term life of its own. So if you want to create a, that kind of a solid company that first, uh, you know, grows in size and scale and then it becomes a sustainable company doing good for all the stakeholder. It's a, it's a, it takes time and hence you must love what you do. It should energize you every day and uh, be in it for a long term. So be passionate, be driven by your dreams. You believe that this is the golden decade for India's beauty and fashion industry. Specifically, how do you see the consumer sentiments in the market over the next 12 to 18 months? And what are the big trends going ahead? And what is the headroom for growth for your business? I think at one point we say that, uh, you know, it's a long-term opportunity. You just said it's a 10-year opportunity. And it's very evident from how the income levels have been lifted 
through our country, throughout our country, the growth is visible, infrastructure is visible, young people are energized by what they can do, and all of that is clearly on the table. Then what happens is sometimes there are some short-term consumption pressures and everyone gets worried about will the long-term consumption come. So I keep saying let's have faith in the long run. I mean, the, our, our consumers who are, you know, we have a lot of young Gen Z millennial consumers who are coming of age. They are starting their new jobs, they are growing and as they grow and have their families, as they grow through life, the consumption is bound to come. And I think the, all the government policies also have been very, very supportive for growth. All of the ingredients are coming together. One is the entrepreneurship, risk taking. Second is the infrastructure. Third is the entire digital backbone infrastructure that we put in place. And uh, everything, and, and also now India is being noticed by uh, global players. What Nike has seen is that most of the global beauty company CEOs have visited visited us in recent times. It's been amazing to see how the global CEOs and chairmen of the top 10 beauty companies have all been in our country wanting to do more. And uh, I think that is what is telling us that the world has interest in working with India and the uh, future is bright. And so therefore there's, there's a lot of potential and headroom or runway for growth for your business as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Like we have said that particularly for beauty and fashion, uh, those are called discretionary consumption items as the consumer incomes rise. And there's a lot of data which now sh says that it's not the next phase of growth is not going to be only about unit consumption. It's also going to come through value consumption. Consumers are going for premiumization. They are going for, they want better quality products. They want to, you know, up, you know uplift their lives and have better education, better uh, you know, they tra they're traveling a lot. They want to consume better. And they're also aspiring for and more. And they're aspiring for more. And beauty and fashion are aspirational categories. They, they want to be the best version of themselves. And, and these industries allow that. And a lot of confidence. We, I've always felt that beauty and fashion is uh, empowering. You know, it gives the consumer the confidence to, to be ready for the world and take on the, the world, so to speak. So I think beauty and fashion are both enablers for consumers' confidence. And it's, it comes from our name. Nika means let the spotlight of your life be on you. And have the confidence and dare to dream and pursue your dreams. How, does the, uh, how, how do things look from where you sit today? We are about to wrap up Q4 uh, you know, in a couple of weeks. Uh, you had a fantastic Q3 uh, because on all metrics, uh, your profits grew well, your top line grew very well. Uh, how does, how, what are the key metrics? How do they look in terms of repeat customers, the gross merchandise value, the average order value, which you mentioned, you know, there is a premium, premiumization that is happening. How do you see all of that evolving in the two parts of the business, which is fashion and then, of course, beauty and uh, personal care? I think, again, what you're asking, the quarter will be good. It's not about the quarter. I think the main thing is that the drivers of efficiency, uh, we believe that there is just uh, so many drivers of efficiency and the productivity of businesses like ours is going to go through the roof. So what AI is doing, what personalization is doing, the kind of personalization we are driving and the quality of conversion improvement we are seeing. And as a result, we are able to do education also at scale. I don't know whether you've seen, but in more recent times, over last one year, uh, the amount of education we are able to do to our consumers because we believe that beauty and fashion consumption is also uh, led by education and knowing uh, about new products and what they can do for the consumer and, and then consumer knowing what products to choose. So I think we are able to do all of this at scale. I think personally I feel that the way the business is changing is so rapid and the benefit of it in terms of productivity gain is going to be massive. And with those, and what productivity does is that for the same inputs, you're able to do more. And as a result, then you can again increase the scale. So I'm very, very optimistic about the future. I think it's difficult to predict. The problem with the capital markets is that while you're working towards creating a fabulous future, market wants accountability for every quarter. So Especially think, well, once you're listed. Once you're listed. So I think there are sometimes you have to do industry building activities like Nika Land was an activity. We call it upper funnel activity. It's creating the awareness about the industry and the power of the industry and sharing that with the consumer. And it's not what we call as a lower funnel activity that can get you business that same quarter. So I think we are also investing for the future. And being a listed company is all about having that right balance of uh, good results in the near term, but also investing for that long term growth.
So you are optimistic about the future would be a short term or, or mid term and even a long term view for you for Nayaka? Long term, I think beauty and fashion, we've said so many times that the per capita consumption in India is so low that it has to be going up multifold. And with the new gains in income that we are seeing and we've seen this journey in China. India is today where China was 15, 16 years ago and it just went through a consumption boom of all types of consumption, particularly beauty and fashion. So we are very confident that that's going to be repeated in India and we have to work towards it. It doesn't happen automatically. We have to work towards by bringing a lot of exciting brands into the country. Also our brands are being sought after now globally. We just opened a new uh, store in GCC and we have plans to be in GCC and we are finding many of our Indian brands are doing fantastic business in GCC and are very well loved and you know being asked for by the consumer. So I think India's future will not just be about consumption in our country which is obviously going to be very strong given the fact that we have large population and their per capita income is growing but the consumption is also going to come for India by having things which are made in India conceived in India, passionately created in India and the world will want them. And I think that also is a very big trend. I think Ayurveda from India could be a very big trend where international consumers may love and seek Indian products with so much of science behind it. I mean, I'm just seeing it all, all over. Over this weekend, I was in Agra and all the foreigners are wearing Indian clothes. So there's no way <laughs> demand for fashion will go up for Indians, but it'll also go up for the world. And what you said is true also for the beauty and personal care as also the fashion business. Yes. Whereas made in India for the world is, is going to be the driver for both businesses. Yes, for both. I think even in fashion, of course, you know, wearing, expecting the whole world to wear ethnic wear every single day is not the reality. But I think uh, many of the international companies have always uh, sourced their products from India, especially in fashion. But our fashion brands and labels have not get, got created. And some of us have vision to, to fill that gap. And why should there not be some brands out of India which leverage Indian art, you know, art, not just artisans and craftsmanship, but also Indian design sensibilities aesthetics. and aesthetics and bring it to the world. And I, 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 I long to see that day. I think in fashion, we are probably a little bit behind the curve. But in beauty and fashion, both places it will happen. In beauty, it's already happening. Um, how is Nayaka looking to scale business over the next two to three years, given the market potential that you talked about? And what are the international expansion plans? Uh, GCC, you mentioned beyond that, are you looking at other markets or will it be a very calibrated expansion? No, I think GCC, uh, we are not just talking about the UAE, but we're talking beyond that. And Kingdom of Sa Saudi Arabia is a very big market. We have gone public to say that we'll have 70 stores in GCC countries over five years. That's quite a big ambition. Uh, also, secondly, we are already there in many countries like Mauritius. Uh, we have some amount of presence in other countries, but it's small, so I don't want to talk too much about it. But yes, there is clear ambition to take Nika beyond the shores of India. You've been an acquisitive company. Is Nika still looking for good buys and acquisitions? And what kind, and what kind of companies would you be keen on? I think one of the couple of acquisitions we had done, one was uh, Dot & Key. Uh, which has been an extremely successful acquisition for us. Uh, Dot & Key has grown to be one of the top skincare brands on our platform. We are extremely happy with how it's done. Um, some are like K-Beauty is a joint venture rather than an acquisition. Uh, we also acquired LBB, which has been a very big asset that has really helped us uh, build um, what I call as content and uh, education at scale. So I think that is an asset which we are using towards that. Uh, we had acquired many small uh, assets also in fashion like 20 dresses, Pippa Bella, all have done well. I think we prefer to, you know, during the cycle when a market's at a cyclical high, we prefer not to chase acquisition then. But we'll wait for those times when, you know, when, when deals come to us. Okay. Could you provide an update on your offline strategy and store expansion? Uh, you had talked about, I think, last, uh, as of December 31, 2023, um, you know, I think you have now 174 odd stores, um, new stores. Now, what is the right mix? Have you arrived at the right mix when it comes to your omni-channel strategy, the number, new, you know, new cities, new stores, I mean, the offline presence? We clearly have plans and we say that always, but you must remember that even with so many stores, retail only accounts for 10% of our business. So in many ways, we are available throughout the country in so many zip codes and with 174 stores we still reach only 60 cities 
and we have said that we have desire to be in about top 100 cities and uh, also the demand for beauty is going up so that even in metro cities we think we'll be rolling out more stores. So with that we have said earlier ambition used to be that we'll do about 350 stores over next few years. Now we've clearly said that we'll extend it to beyond 350 to about 500 stores. So I think we will be at 200 stores this uh, Actually, we, we count it a little differently, so you get confused because we have something called kiosk that we sometimes don't count. So we'll be at about 200, 250 stores over next one year, and then beyond that, hopefully, uh, we'll continue to build towards 500 stores. Over what period of time uh, have we you We said three to five years. We don't want to be in a rush. I think we don't need to like just have the store for sake of the number. I think at the moment, we are upgrading our stores in terms of their size and uh, the number of brands that are in our stores is just going through the roof. A lot of ex excellent and uh, exciting international brands are coming on our platform. You must have seen Kylie Cosmetics. Uh, sorry, you must have seen um, uh, Fenty Beauty. You must have seen Kylie Cosmetics is in our G uh, GCC store. That's why I got confused. Uh, but uh, Florence by Mills, we've just launched. And they're just exciting brands being launched every day. So our stores are going to get bigger. So there's a lot of effort going into upgrading the size and scale of the stores. There'll be more premium stores. Uh, so yeah, the, it's quite exciting. And number, I mean, 500 is a number. We'll move towards that is what we say. I wanted to uh, understand from you your take on the recent instances of governance issues, the compliance issues, financial mismanagement in some of the well-known startups because you are an entrepreneur who has achieved a lot in life. Uh, do you think these kind of instances that we have seen in the last few weeks, months actually raises bigger questions on how companies need to be steered? And do you think it will add to the problems faced by entrepreneurs in terms of maybe having an additional intense scrutiny from investors going forward? Of course, and investors will have more intense scrutiny. But I think if governance has to be at the core of your, um, you know, governance is very important. And uh, governance frameworks have to be set ahead of the, you know, at very early stage of an entrepreneurial journey, and I mean, at the company's journey. And uh, governance is everything. I think Nike has been very strong on governance. And I think the companies, um, also will learn their lesson that they cannot make compromises on governance. Uh, governance, um, compromising on governance because you're growing is, or you because you're going for size and scale, that's not justification of not following the rules. So if the industry has rules laid out, then the companies have to follow them. Uh, how do you see competition from large and established players and how is Nike positioned to, to grow its market share, to defend and also grow its turf? Uh, you know, when it comes to, you know, more deep pocket competition coming in from the likes of Reliance and Tata's? I think um, in uh, beauty is a very, it was a small niche category. We grew it into a much bigger category. Now that the category is bigger, it is having interest from a lot of globe. I mean, a lot of uh, large companies, conglomerates from the country. They are all in retail. It was a natural extension for them to extend their retail presence in new areas. So I think, but Nika has a huge uh, lead and an advantage in terms of whether it is brands, whether it is customers, whether it is uh, the business and knowledge of the business. So we will obviously, we will hope to defend our business. And uh, anyway, I believe that retail is a very big segment. There is space for many. It's not, retail has never been like one person takes the whole market. There are always a couple of retailers who will flourish and hopefully we'll be one of them. So not daunted by the competition. Uh, I mean, we just, I, I always say that let's stay focused on the consumer and let's give them far beyond the expectations so that consumer doesn't have a reason to go to competition. Palgurina, it was wonderful speaking to you. Thank you so much for speaking to PTI. Thank you. My pleasure.